Hello, everyone. My name is Chanel Blackwood, and I am the marketing manager at Tokia. Welcome, and thank you for registering for today's workshop, Techniques for Active Learning. What are they, and how can I use them in my health economics courses? Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and will be recorded and uploaded on our website afterwards. Before we get started today, I just wanted to run through a couple of housekeeping items. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's call, please type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be happy to assist. Everyone on the line has been muted except for our speakers in an, in an effort to eliminate background noise. We'll be holding all questions until the end of the session, and we'll, faci we'll facilitate a Q&A portion. I'll now hand things over to Dai. Dai, over to you. So I'll try again. Hello, everyone. I'm Di McIntyre. I'm one of the Teaching Health Economics uh, Special Interest Group conveners. And I just wanted to welcome everyone to the third in our series of virtual workshops um, in which we are talking about different uh, health economics teaching skills. And um, I wanted to also thank Heather Brown, um, who is another of the Teaching Health Economics SIG conveners, who will assist with aspects of, of the workshop. Um, but my role is really just to introduce you to our two speakers today. Um, the first is um, Jill Boylston Herndon, and she's the principal consultant at uh, Key Analytics and Consulting. Uh, but her passion really is around teaching and uh, she is affiliated. She has an uh, affiliated research associate professorship at the University of Florida and also a sen uh, an affiliate senior fellow of practice at the University of Iowa. Um, so Jill will be providing um, the first presentation and also um, assisting with, with some of the, the discussion. And then our, our second speaker will be Femi Ayadi, um, who is Professor of Healthcare Administration at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. And I'm sure those of us that have participated in some of the Teaching Health Economic Special Interest Group activities before will have um, met either or both of Jill and Femi. Um, so on that note, I'm going to hand over to um, Jill. Good morning, um, and I'm so delighted to be here, and I'd like to thank Di for the invitation. I'm always delighted to be able to participate in things with Femi because I learned so much from her. Um, so we actually wanted to start this session by getting some information from all of you about the types of active learning you are currently engaged in. And this is also where I'm learning um, something new as well, because I have not used Jamboard before, but Heather Brown has, and so she's going to to um, show the Jamboard for us and kind of guide us through the process of um, you posting um, examples of active learning that you're currently engaged in. So, Heather. Thanks very much, Jill. So I'm just going to share my screen. So Di had put um, a link to this Jamboard, which all of you should be able to access and edit. Um, into the chat. So if you haven't seen that, please have a look. And what we're going to be doing is um, putting post-it notes. So to do that, you click on this sticky note here. So click on that, and then you can write a message. When you're happy with your message, you press save, and then it just goes here. And then I can help kind of arrange them. So just post your message, and then I can sort the rest out from there. Um, does anyone have any questions before I pass it back to Jill? If you do, just raise your hand because otherwise I can't see. Nope. Okay, great. Jill, back to you. Help if I unmuted myself. Yeah, so those of you who are participating today, if you would post um, examples of the types of active learning you're engaged in on the 
um, Jamboard whiteboard, that would be great. I'll give you a minute to do that. Role plays and simulations. Peer-to-peer -peer learning. I love that. Case studies. This is a really good variety. Small group discussion. This is great. So we wanted to get a feel for some of the things that people um, are doing. Um, and we can see a real variety. And so there may be things that um, you're doing that you're real comfortable with. There may be things other people are doing that you've been curious about that you'd like to learn more about. And so one of our goals for the overall session is to have you all be engaged in the discussion and to share your tips on active learning. So we really have three parts to this webinar. For the first part, I'm going to do a brief overview of active learning. And then Femi, the second part, Femi is going to give a specific example that she uses in her courses. And then the last section of our segment of today's session will be to get examples from you all, as well as address any questions um, that you have. So thank you for sharing those activities. And I hope that at the end, you'll um, be able to share some more about the things that you've been doing and what's been working well and what hasn't. Um, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen, hopefully successfully. And there we go. You should be able to see my slides. So, okay. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm going to just start out with a brief overview of active learning. I'll talk about some of the barriers and challenges as well as factors that contribute to success and how to overcome some of the challenges or at least how to work within the constraints you may be facing because you may have some things that you don't have a lot of control over. Um, and we really hope that you'll leave this session with some new ideas, some inspiration, enthusiasm for trying something new in your courses wherever you are in your active learning journey. So we saw from the Jamboard that many of you are do, using different forms of active learning. Um, but let me ask this, among those of you um, that are participating today, um, you can use the raise hand feature. Are there any of you who are unsure if you're even using active learning? If so, you can use the raise hand feature. Okay, so nobody seems to be unsure. Sometimes we have people say, well, I don't even know if what I'm doing is active learning. Um, so let's talk about what is active learning. And in its simplest form, it's not passive learning. That is, students aren't just sitting in the room as empty vessels to receive information that's delivered to them. They're engaged in their own learning. They use and apply knowledge. And important to this process is the opportunity for them to connect new material to prior knowledge and experience. And it's not just a difference in the student's role, but also in your role as an instructor. You're really a facilitator of learning. You're facilitating the learning process rather than simply being a content expert. Although the content expert is helpful and important, um, but you're helping students to become better learners and importantly, independent learners. And I think when you see Femi's example, you'll see a really great example of that. Um, just a little bit from learning theory. Learning involves acquisition of information, retention of that information, and transfer. And it's the last one, transfer, that gets at the ability to apply knowledge. And a critical phase of information processing is the encoding that meaningfully organizes material and moves it from short-term to long-term memory. And the crucial part of long-term memory is how well organized the information is, and that relies on proper encoding. Other thing that's important is the connections between new and previously learned information promotes that encoding. Um, and another thing that's important to keep in mind is that there's only so much information that a person's short-term memory can process. As I think 
many of us can attest to that. Um, a general rule of thumb is seven plus or minus two chunks of information. And chunking refers to combining pieces of information so that it's easier to process. So a 10 digit phone number gets grouped into three or four chunks of numbers. And I really like this quote from Saunders. It's an oldie, but a goodie. As teachers, we must resist the pressure to cover the field. It's not what's covered, but what the student learns that counts. And there's so much information, but we really cannot cover it all. And if we try, students surely will not learn it all. And they may even learn less if the focus is merely on content delivery because they don't have the opportunity to process the information in a way that it transfers to long-term memory. And even if they manage to retain the information, they may not know how to use it in a meaningful way. Um, so really thinking about what the student's gonna take away from the course versus just what we're pushing out to them. And the other key takeaway is that active learning promotes this encoding that's so important by helping students apply knowledge and connect it to previously learned material. Most of the myths and impediments to implementing active learning center around the idea that it has to be this big complicated endeavor, that it requires significant content reduction, that it requires complicated group activities, that it won't work well in large classes, and that it requires a ton of extra course time. It could be that involved, but it doesn't have to be. It really encompasses a wide range of activities. Active learning can be more involved and complex, like using a flipped classroom, developing simulations, doing case studies and games, but it can also be a matter of peppering your lectures with opportunities for students to write, discuss, or apply the information being presented. And I like to spend some time on the enhanced lecture piece because many people don't have the luxury of small classes, and it's also an easy, effective way to incorporate active learning when you're pressed for time or you're just getting started. And there are a lot of ways to build active learning into lectures. Um, the pause procedure is when you take a break every 13 to 18 minutes, you give students an opportunity to compare and rework their notes for a couple of minutes. Think, pair, share is when you have students discuss a question that you've posed and then talk about it and have them share within a larger group. And you can even have students write the answers individually first. Audience response is very popular and works well, of course, in Zoom. This is where you have quiz, quiz questions or surveys and polls. You can use it before introducing a topic to gauge their baseline understanding. You can use it after presenting information to see if they got the main takeaways um, or just to engage them in the material. Um, problem solving, um, this is one I like to do a lot. Instead of just presenting a sample problem and going through it right away, give them the problem and have them work on it in pairs or on their own or in groups, however it works in your classroom for a little while, and then go through it because then they're already engaged and thinking about it and have questions. Um, so there's a lot of other types of examples. And this enhanced lecture is often where people may be unsure if they're doing active learning because they'll say, well, is it really active learning if you ask a student to pause and reflect on something? And yes, it is, because you're engaging the student in their learning. In the interest of time, I'm not doing examples for each of these different types of active learning, but I would note that they're, even though they're in distinct boxes, they're not mutually exclusive. So writing activities span the spectrum, right? It can be part of enhanced lectures. It can be part of case studies, group projects, et cetera. Um, and similarly, using discussion um, can span across these. And the other thing to note is some of these can be done individually, writing, enhanced lecture, um, and so forth. So not everything requires interaction with other students. And similarly, in a really big lecture hall, you can still have interaction between students, even if you just have them pairing off with their neighbor to talk about something. So there's a lot of opportunities and options. I wanted to briefly discuss, especially for those of you who may be relatively new to using active learning, some considerations about how you might go about selecting and developing activities since there's a range of opportunities and it could seem overwhelming if you're just getting started. I wanna take a minute and use the chat feature. And I want those of you who are participating live um, to please put in the chat a simple yes or no. 
Um, how many of you like the idea in your classes of having an activity where students debate topics? So if you could type in the chat, yes or no, no way, not for me. I see one yes. Anybody else want to weigh in if they think that would be fun or not so much fun to do? A lot of yeses. Any no's? Are there any no's? People say, no, that's not for me. Okay, well, I'm going to put it out there. I'm in the no camp. That's not something I'm super comfortable with. Um, how many like the idea of a completely discussion-based format without any lecture at all? How many would say yes and how many would say no, no way? Maybe, no. So this is good, like, so Femi and I could talk to each other because like I, like the whole debate thing, not comfortable, but the discussion-based format, I've done that and like it, it kind of worked out. Um, so, so some people are comfortable with some types of active learning activities and maybe a good fit for, for your personality, for your students, for your, what you're comfortable with and others, maybe not so much are a good fit for you. And so trying something new inherently involves some level of risk, but it's risk that you can manage, right? There's a lot of options. So for the next few slides, we'll go through some scales on different considerations in developing active learning exercises. As we go through this, you can think about where you are on each spectrum. Um, there's no right or wrong, good or bad, just different. And um, one of the things um, is when you think about where you are in the spectrum, that helps you to determine what types of active learning activities may be a good fit for you at this point in time. Um, so the first thing to know is why are you doing it? What is it you want your students to know or to be able to do as a result? And you can think about this in the context of Bloom's taxonomy. So identify what are your learning objectives for the activity and don't keep them a secret. Let your students know what your goals are. Um, for more advanced students, active learning can also involve them setting forth their own learning objectives. So the design of the activity will be influenced by your students' knowledge of the discipline. So again, we want them to be able to connect, relate, and build upon prior knowledge and experience. Interest is also important, helping them understand how it's relevant for their goals. So I teach a lot of medical students and I'm always thinking about how can I connect this to the relevance for patient care for them? Um, but it's different than teaching, you know, master's students in economics, um, time, making the connection for them so it ties into their interests. And so that's important how you might frame an activity and how you design it. Um, students' comfort level with different instructional techniques and the instructional culture where you are could also have an impact. So it's good to be cognizant of that and think about how you might move students out of their comfort zone, but not to the point that it would actually hinder learning. A related consideration is the amount of structure that students are used to and prefer. Again, not to say you don't want to challenge them, but it's something you should be prepared um, for and aware of. Um, and so, like I mentioned, I led discussion classes and one time it went, actually a couple of times it went fabulously. There was one time it was a complete disaster. I wasn't different, the students were different. Um, and so there's ways you can manage and deal that, but that was like a big eye opener for me because I thought I had a successful format and then I encountered a group of students that went, oh, this isn't working for us. And we had to work through that together. Um, similarly, you have to think about your own experience and comfort level. If you haven't done active learning before, you might want to start small. If you're someone who likes a lot of organization, it may be hard to let a discussion go where it may. Um, if you do something you're not comfortable with, it may not work out well. The other thing is you may be in a more or less supportive environment to try out new things. I've been fortunate in that I've always been in places that were really supportive. It may be a tougher road to experiment with new approaches if the environment's not supportive. Um, also, I routinely get assessment throughout the course to help address issues early on rather than waiting till the final course evaluations. And we'll talk a little bit more about assessment later. And then there's your physical environment, right? That's gonna influence things. Are you in a large classroom or a small classroom? Do you have a lot of students, a few students? Um, are you 
are your students all there in real time or are some of them watching a video replay later so that you have a lot of asynchronous learning? Um, are you in a big lecture hall with fixed desks and chairs or are you in a room that accommodates students working in groups really easily? And then what kind of tech supports do you have? Is it a very low tech environment or higher tech environment? None of these are hard stops, even in the most fixed large classroom with low tech, you can do active learning, but the types of things you do and how you do them will be influenced by that environment that you're in. So taking all of these things together, you can think about the type of active learning that makes sense for you. Generally, if you are more on the left hand side of the spectrum for the various considerations, then you're probably more likely to be using active learning activities that are less complex, have more structure and less interaction, at least when you're first getting started. And I really like this um, summary of thinking about what's relatively low risk and what's relatively high risk. And an activity that's low risk for one person, maybe debates for Femi, might be high risk for somebody else, like for me. Um, based on the topic, your students' experience and knowledge, and your experience and knowledge. Um, so again, you know, people are comfortable with managing different types of activities, while someone else may find the same type of activity very difficult to facilitate. Okay, so we just go through um, a few of the common barriers that people raise to active learning. One is time. How much time is this going to take? So one is you can just start small and then develop and build over time incrementally. And you can trade some of your lecture development and delivery for some active learning development and implementation. And so one of the things to think about is everything, all your content, is it truly essential? Um, or are there things you might be able to let go of to instill a deeper understanding of what is really foundational for your students to leave with? Another thing to think about, is there some pre-assignment you can do to have the students prepare and learn some of the material before they even get into the classroom? Um, student resistance. So to kind of proactively counter potential resistance, especially if students who aren't as used to active learning activities as always explaining what you're doing and why. You can provide structure and guidance around the activity, and then always getting feedback to see what their experience was so that you can keep refining your activities over time. Um, the physical space, like we talked about before, you just wanna do the activities with those limitations in mind. If there is something that you think, man, if I only had the right room, I could do something really cool. You might explore at your institution, is there one or two days where you could reserve a room that's more conducive to doing active learning? So even if you can't get that room for the whole term, could you get it for a couple of sessions? So that might be something you could explore to overcome that if you have something you'd really like a better space for. And then sometimes it can be hard if you're doing something more like something discussion-based. Um, and so again, you might feel like I don't have as much control when I'm not lecturing. Again, you can start small, you can build in enough structure to make both yourself and your students comfortable. And again, assessing what's working and not working and developing a good support network like we all are here. Um, and then thinking about how you can challenge yourself to try something new, um, take a little bit of risk. And I do wanna be cognizant though, how much risk you take on in part will be affected by how supportive your environment is in allowing you to take risks. And I know that that can really vary. Okay, so I'm a huge fan of getting feedback. It helps in a lot of ways. There's a lot going on with students that you may not be aware of without asking. Um, so, and it can allow you to make adjustments midway. The quickest form of feedback is literally called the minute paper. The original questions with the minute paper was what was the most important thing you learned during this class and what important question remains unanswered. And so I started out with that because I always like to go with the proven approach. But what I found my students were saying on those is they were writing down what they thought I thought was important. And that's not the feedback that I wanted to get. What I wanted to know really was what were they getting that was useful out of the course. So I changed it to what was the most useful thing you learned during this class, because I wanted their perspective, not what they thought my perspective was on what was important. And then um, 
change you can change the what important question remains unanswered to what remains muddiest or you can just simply ask what questions do you have do you have any concerns and this is assessment is anonymous feedback and you literally could do this every class or once a week whatever frequency feels right to you and after i've been doing this for a while i'd have assessments that would just say how's it going do you have any questions? Because the students were familiar with the process, but it really helps you to get a sense of what's working and not. Um, you can do activity specific assessments, especially if you're doing a more involved activity and you want to get feedback specifically on that activity. You can design your own or sometimes they may already be out there. Um, and you can also have the, the most elaborate form of assessment through um, a formal study. Um, the key part of assessment is you need to circle back with the students. Let them know you're using their feedback. And it's important if you're changing anything because of their feedback, let them know. If you're not changing something, if they say, I, we're really not happy with this and you're not changing it, let them know why. Let them know you heard them, but based on your judgment and your goals for the course, this is why you think it's important not to change course. And I always like to share too with each class, the things that I've changed in my course based on past students' feedback, because then they know that you're really listening to what they um, have to say. Um, so um, I think I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, let me just think. The other thing that you can do is you can do a general midterm assessment that um, asks about how things the course is going. And I do that a lot when I'm teaching a new course or I'm kind of really revamping a course. And that way you don't get too many surprises at the end of the course and you're not leaving things unaddressed. So you can do midterm assessments and that can be really um, useful. I also wanna mention that I think when we're sharing with each other the things that we've done really well, that it's also good to share with each other our disasters because you can learn a lot from the things you try out that don't go well. Um, and I don't wanna take up more time because I'm really excited to hear um, Femi's, I think, and you'll be excited to hear Femi's example. But if we have time later and you wanna hear my discussion-based success story and disaster story, <laughs> I'd be happy to share it because I do think we learn a lot from that. The next few slides are just some resources, general resources, um, as well as some IHEA specific resources, um, which I think Di showed right at the beginning. So with that, I wanna thank you very much. I'm gonna hand it off to Femi for a terrific example of how she uses active learning in her courses.